Amen. So we are in our uh, final sermon of the sermon series, Sent Life. And as you guys know, we've been talking about how can we live a sent life to, to the ones that we know and love, to our friends, our family, our, our neighbors that we don't know. Uh, we want to be sent just as the Father sent Jesus and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to then go and be sent into the world to reach the world with his love. And so one of the tools that we've used are the bold habits. And uh, these bold habits are not just, uh, you know, we have a shirt that says live a bold life, right? That's not just a cute saying. We want you to actually go out and live this bold life, living out these habits. And we think that these habits can empower you to, to go and, and reach the people uh, that God has called you to for his kingdom and to give them love. And so we are to be with and bless others. We're to observe and obey the spirit. We're to demonstrate, uh, we're to live and learn Jesus. And then finally, the last bold habit is to demonstrate and declare the kingdom. And so the bold habit number four is what we're covering again this week. You, you'll recall last week, Keith talked about demonstrating the kingdom. And this week, I'm going to focus really on what it means to declare the kingdom of God to those that we've been sent to. And so I'm just going to jump right into the very first point and, and just get it right out there. I think that one of the greatest joys that we as Christians have is that we get to be a part of declaring the kingdom of God is here. That should be one of our greatest joys in life, and yet so often we're hesitant to do it, and we don't really have necessarily an emotional attachment to that. But the truth is, all throughout the New Testament, we read about this concept of, of declaring or proclaiming that the kingdom of God has arrived. And we see it all through the Gospels, and we see it in, in all, all sorts of different areas in the New Testament. And in fact, before Jesus fully fulfilled his role, right, before he fully went to the cross, died, was buried, you know, rose again to establish his kingdom, when he launches his ministry, in Mark chapter 1, he proclaims that the good news of the kingdom has arrived. It says in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. And so we can clearly see that the kingdom and the gospel, it is one and the same. The fact that the kingdom has come to earth is the good news. People don't fully understand who Jesus is at this point. They don't understand that his death and resurrection would make a way into the kingdom. And yet here he's merging the concept together. And he says you can repent now. Turn from yourself. Turn from your own kingdom and trust in the gospel message. Trust in the good news that the kingdom of God is here. And I love how in Mark 16, 15, right before Jesus uh, sends out his disciples... Or rather, when Jesus returned to his disciples after being uh, sent to the cross and, and he, he was crucified, he died, he rose again, right? And so right before um, he did this, he says to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And so this concept of proclaiming news, it, it would have been a really well-known practice in Jesus' time. In fact... What's interesting here is Jesus is proclaiming the news in, in what would be considered an official way, the way that they're using this word proclaim. And, and what is actually interesting is that a proclamation like this was typically reserved for a king. This is what a king would do when he wanted to publicize his decrees or when he wanted to just let people know of good news. He would send out a herald into the kingdom and they would go about and officially proclaim the good news. And, and one of the most important times that this would happen is actually after a time of war. And so the king would go out and he would send then his ambassadors to announce the victory and proclaim a new kingdom has been ushered in. There is a, a new way, a new order. And the new kingdom is here. And you know what I think is amazing to me? is that Jesus here is taking the role of that ambassador. 
And he calls us to take the role of that ambassador. And he's saying, God has won the war. The kingdom of God is here. The new order has started. You don't have to live any longer under this kingdom of darkness that's affiliated with sickness and death and depression and all these other things that we think of, all these other like sick things that are just floating out there. God says, that doesn't have to be a part of your kingdom anymore. Come live under this new order. Enter into the kingdom of God. I think it's, it's crazy that we've, we've developed this mindset of fear when it comes to sharing the good news, right? Oh, what are people going to think of me? But we're coming with amazing news. If they truly understood what the kingdom of God was, this would be the best news of their life, and we get to be a part of declaring that to them. That is an honor, a gift, and a privilege that God gives us. I'm glad that he didn't just suddenly make a giant announcement with his you know, he- megaphone from heaven, hey, you know, I- I- I've won, C- come, come to the kingdom, I'm-, I'm the new king now. Like, no, he's saying, I entrust you with that. Just as I had the joy of bringing Jesus into the world, now you get to bring Jesus into the world. And that to me is amazing. It's a gift, and we shouldn't be afraid. The picture on the screen here is uh, a picture that was taken in Austin, Texas. It was during one of the very first celebrations of Juneteenth. And being, being someone from uh, Chicago, Illinois area, I, I didn't know what this was. And I'm so thankful that over this time, my, my wife has been in the education uh, as a teacher, now a principal, and, and so she's gotten to know what this is. And I've taught my, you know, my kids have been raised now in Texas. And, and I, I love what it, what it means to, to so many people and what it should mean to all of us. But what's interesting is, as we know, on Freedom's Eve, January 1st, 1863, you had all these enslaved African Americans and other people just waiting for the Emancipation Proclamation to go into effect. And as the stroke of midnight happened, right, the prayers were answered and there's rejoicing and there's tears of joy and everyone was, was, was cheering and so happy. And yet we know this was for some of the people. Because we know here in Texas and other areas, it wasn't until June 19th, 1865, this is, you know, multiple years later, that they finally heard the good news, that they finally heard in Galveston Bay, Texas, that they were free. And the, the, the coolest thing to me is that many of the people that got to announce to these people who were still enslaved under this old kingdom, under this old way of life, Many of those people were actually formerly enslaved. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being, being someone who is formerly enslaved and getting to say, we're finally free. We're finally free. The joy that that must have been. Now, we know. We know that the history of slavery in the U.S., it was horrific, right? It was degrading. It was abusive. It was dehumanizing, Families were destroyed. People were robbed of their God-given image and treated as objects to be known. But do you know, I think that the slavery that existed in the United States is simply a fleshing out of the kingdom of darkness that is in this world, that rules over this world, and that rules over every one of our hearts if we allow it to take control. And I see our role not too dissimilar from those who were formerly enslaved in the United States, now being free, and now having the ability to go and say, hey, you no longer have to live like this. You don't have to face this garbage anymore. You can be free. What an amazing joy that must have been, and what an amazing joy it is for us. And so it is our privilege, it's our honor to declare the kingdom of God that it's here and, and, you know, I think one of the reasons that we're so reluctant is because we're afraid that our good news is actually bad news to people because we are so hyper-focused on the sin component of it, right? We, we're afraid that as we confront people with sin in their lives, that they're going to receive our good news as bad news. And because of this, we kind of clam up and we just don't do it because, like, I don't, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to be the target of someone's anger. I don't want to make them feel bad. None of us want to do that. But the truth is, 
the kingdom of God is about becoming free from our sin. It is about be escaping the punishment of our sin that is very real. But that's just part of that. It's just part of what the good news is and part of what makes the kingdom so amazing. And so I think that instead of just talking about sin, as we declare the kingdom of God is here, we must give a broader explanation of what the kingdom is like. And I think that's going to offer us a different kind of freedom as we share where we will be less reluctant. And quite honestly, I think it's going to reach more people. I think more people, we're going to meet them where they're at instead of immediately going to, to the sin component, which again, we, we do have to do that at some point. But I think that the average person who's not a Christian, when they're thinking about Christianity, what are they thinking about? They're thinking about it's a, it's a religion about right and wrong. It's about heaven and hell. It's about angering a God and getting on his good side. And, and you know, again, I'm, I'm so glad that I don't have to face the wrath of God at some point. And I know we all rejoice in that. Now, that, that, you know, we're part of his kingdom. And there is right and wrong, but being part of the kingdom is so much more than this. And I love how when Jesus first introduced himself as the Messiah or as the king of this new messianic kingdom, what did he do when he went to his, his hometown in Nazareth and first introduced himself as, as a Messiah? If we look at Luke 4, chapter 14 through 21, I think what's really awesome here is we don't see Jesus rising up and giving this sin, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God gospel presentation. It says this, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit... And the news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, and continuing in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim, again we see that word proclaim, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down in the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened to him. What is he going to say next? And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled, fulfilled in your hearing. And by the way, this was, this was to their ears blasphemous because they clearly knew he was proclaiming himself to be the king. And, and right after this they took him and they were going to throw him off a cliff and stone him. But you know, I think it's so easy for us as we're sharing the good news, to get caught up in this reductionist view of the gospel that hyper-focuses on sin. And we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about or, or thinking about how the gospel relates to everyday life, like Jesus is doing here. And so we start to see and talk about the gospel in this super narrow way. We treat it like we're selling this product that's one-time use, Right, and the primary use of it is a ticket to get into heaven and to escape God's wrath. But we're not promoting it as Jesus does here. And he's saying the, the kingdom of God offers you this radically different and better way of life. Not just for you, but for the entire world. Now doesn't that sound like a better message than going up to someone and saying, Hey, you're sinning, you're doing something wrong, get right with God? Again, we have to we have, to have gentle, polite, you know, conversations about that at, at some point as we're presenting the gospel message that, hey, some of the reason that some of this stuff is happening to you is because there's sin in the world. There's sin in your life. You can do something about that. But the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom is so much more. So let's look at this passage a little more closely and see how, how did Jesus talk about, how did he share the good news of the kingdom? And one of the first things that he talks about is that in God's kingdom, the poor are cared for. This is where he's saying, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And, you know, I think that God has a special place in his heart for the poor. 
In fact, I know he does. You know, even in the book of Deuteronomy, which, which contains many of the words of, of instruction for the Israel, Israelites right before they're going to go into the promised land, being a foreshadowing of the future kingdom to come, what did he say again and again and again? What are the instructions that he gave to them again and again and again? It was to care for the, for, for the poor. Deuteronomy 15, 7, he says, But if there's any poor Israelites in your town when you arrive in the land of the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Right? Give generously. He says, actually in verse 10, he says, Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Verse 24, he says, Never take advantage of the poor and destitute laborers in your midst. And it goes on and on and on, verse after verse, talking about how they need to take care of the poor. And we know that God's heart has always been for the poor. And so if we declare this in his present kingdom, that the poor are seen, that the poor aren't overlooked, that the poor are cared for, don't you think that communicates a beautiful message to the world that writes the church off so easily and writes the gospel message as this this hell and brimstone thing? No, the church is meant to make a difference in the world. Joe Bob, who's saying amen over there. uh, Thank you, Joe Bob. We're good friends, so he he always tries to encourage me with his amen. Thank you, brother. Oh, where are you, Joe Bob? Um, So so I want to tell a story, actually, about me and Joe Bob. Because one uh, one of the greatest paradigm shifts that happened to me in ministry was... About five years ago when we did this event called Love Leander, and it's permanently changed the way that I look at service projects. And so, you know, we were going out. Um, Love Leander was basically going out into the community, mobilizing a bunch of different churches to serve homes and, and neighborhoods um, that needed help, people that just needed help. And, and some of the areas we went to uh, were people who were, you know, under-resourced and, and in, in poverty in some situations. And so... I, I, I'll never forget the situation. We go up to this woman, and, you know, there's stuff all over her yard. Her house is clearly falling apart. Uh, the house was divided into two. It's kind of this, this, this weird-looking thing. And she comes out, um, and we just explain to her, hey, you know, we, we would love to do X, Y, and Z. Just explain to her what we wanted to offer her, um, and that we'd have volunteers out there to bless her house and, 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 and be able to just minister to her, help her clean up, help her to repair and she was, you know, as we're talking, she's just getting happier and happier, just the glow on her face. And she just stops. And we look at her, and she's like, why are you doing this? And we said, we're doing this because we believe that God wants us to do this. We believe that he sent us to you. And all of a sudden, tears, right? It went from this happy, elated look to her face changes. Tears start rolling down her face. She said, God sent you to me? And she shared with us that she had just been praying for help. She didn't know how she was going to take care of all these problems. She had just been praying for help and that we were sent as an answer to her prayers. And I say this was a paradigm shift for me because it's really easy for us as, as Americans to think that the number one problem that we're trying to fix is that we're, we're, we're giving people things, right? And, and I hate to say, say that this so bluntly, but like we, we might just be paving a better roadway to hell in some sense if we're not also giving them Jesus. And so what, what I realized was as we were sharing with her that we were sent by her, uh, we were sent by God to her, it's not about just the things that we're giving or the things that we're doing. It's about saying, hey, God cares about you. God does not overlook you. God sees you. And this is one of the great amazing things about the gospel message is that God's kingdom cares for the poor. Isn't it an amazing message that we get to carry out? Some people just need to know that they're not overlooked in this world because, and especially in America, right, we're just so busy doing our own thing. We're all so busy trying to get ahead. And Sometimes it's so easy for us to not look at our neighbors just down the street and see what they're going through. God cares for the poor. Now let me just say one more thing about the poor since God has so much to say about this. Um, is 
you know, when I think about all the problems that exist in the world, I was, I was struggling with this a couple weeks ago as I was thinking about it. I feel like God has been challenging me personally to do more things because I feel like I've been, I'm just authentic Tim here. Um, I feel like it's very easy for me as a pastor to get sucked into the church ministry and like miss out on the ministry that God specifically has for me and my family as it relates to giving to the poor, as it relates to caring for persecuted Christians, as it relates to whatever. And so I'm trying to like regain my personal identity of what does it mean for Tim Schlung, not, not Pastor Tim, but Tim Schlung to serve the community. And, and as I was thinking about that, I was just getting more and more overwhelmed, like, what do I do? Where do I go? You know? And one of the things that, that popped into my head, actually, uh, is, is uh, something Pastor Derek said a while ago. Um, and then I think it, it made an impact on, on Brian, and then Brian talked about it. He didn't say it to me, but he said it to Brian, and then Brian shared it in a sermon one day. But it's, do for the one what you wish you could do for the many. And... Um, And that to me, and I hope for you, it's like, I don't have to save the whole world. You know, I have access to all the problems in the world now, right? Because we have social media and we have we have news, and you almost you almost have the omniscience of God, but you don't have the omnipotence of God. Like I know everything bad that's going on, but I don't know how to fix it all. And so I love um, that idea of doing for the one what you wish you could do for the many. And you know, case in point is this man named Alan Graham. I want to put a picture up here. Um, Alan Graham, if you recognize him, he's the founder of Community First Village. And Community First Village is this amazing, beautiful um, community of micro homes. And uh, it's intended to serve the homeless in the Austin area, to address that 3% of chronic homelessness in the Austin area. And it's uh, it's like a community garden. It has art shops. It has opportunities for them to learn trades and and participate in society has a movie theater to help merge the community with uh with the homeless population because as we know it's not primarily drugs it's not primarily uh mental illness that people are on the streets because we've some of us have used drugs some of us have or have gone through you know mental illness and yet we're not on the streets why because we have a community of people around us and so this is this is to me like the epitome of what it looks like to serve the poor in a, in, a, in a way that is loving, is caring. But you know what? He never started this organization, you know, as it is. Basically, he started because he was, he was driving past, I don't know if it was I-35 or what, he kept on going past day after day seeing some homeless people under the bridge. And he's like, I got to do something about this. And so he, in his little green, you know, old beaten down minivan, he told some other people, he's like, hey, we got to do something about this. And they just started making sandwiches and going, you know, once a week and bringing sandwiches to the poor. And that eventually developed into Mobile Loaves and Fishes, which uh, is an organization that, that does that on a regular basis, but it involves way more people. And then eventually he's like, you know, God wants me to do even more, and it expanded to something like this. So all I'm saying about the poor is it's so easy for us to get overwhelmed with how, how do we do something, and the truth is, you have no idea the seed that you plant, how God's going to use that, but start somewhere. Start with one person, because in God's kingdom, he cares for the poor. And, um, oh wow, that was, I didn't realize that so loud. Um, losing my place in my notes here. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, okay. So we're moving on to our second point here of what God's kingdom is like. So we know that God's kingdom, he, he cares for the poor, right? He deeply cares for the poor. But also as Jesus is introducing the kingdom, he's introducing the, what the gospel actually is. He says that in God's kingdom, the guilty are forgiven. And this comes from the portion where he says, uh, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners. And, you know, it's not too hard to figure out what's going on here. What is he saying why are prisoners in prison? Prisoners are, pri- are in prison because they've done something wrong. They've, they've broken the law. And so what Jesus is saying here is that he sent me to set the prisoners free. He sent me to forgive, right? Because in God's kingdom, the guilty can be forgiven. Now, one of the many ministries at Life Church that I love um, 
but, but one of my favorites, honestly, is Kairos Prison Ministry. And this is an opportunity we all, you know, we recently talked about it, but it is an opportunity to go into prisons and basically let people know who have done some things that they shouldn't have done and they're, they're in prison now, that you may be guilty, but in God's kingdom, you can be forgiven and set free. And I love this excerpt of testimonies from, from Kairos uh, participants. I, I, I read this once. It was during the pandemic when y'all were at home, you know, doing whatever you're doing, claiming you're watching online. Um, <laughs> we know. We know, people, because I would be doing the same thing. But I don't know, I don't know if, uh, how many people got to hear this, but I'm, I'm going to read it again. It says, it says this. It says, and again, this is from a prisoner. Up until the day I went to Kairos, I was really lost. Lost in sin, thought, and the way I was. Every other word out of my mouth was a cuss word or of impure thoughts or actions. I cared nothing about anybody's feelings or my own. I'm serving a life sentence for murder. I've been locked up 19 years, and I must do 21 more years before even being considered for parole. Yet I am already set free. I have never felt so much freedom because Jesus Christ has set me free. I was blessed to have been chosen by God. I am a changed man and because of it, so is my family. Am I perfect? No. Do I still make mistakes? Yes. But today I understand the difference and know I am still loved. I attended Kairos. I started to see people that cared about other people. I took God into my heart, into my mind, and a big load was taken from me. I felt good inside, happy to be alive for the first time in my life that I could remember. I saw life could change for me if I tried. Kairos changed my life. I was depressed, alone, ashamed of what I did, and God came to me through the volunteers of Kairos, and they helped me lead into a saving knowledge of Christ and the peace and joy that brings. This is an absolutely and amazingly beautiful testimony of the work of God that he can do in our lives, that he can do in the lives of prisoners. But I don't know about you, as, 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 as I'm reading this, I see a little bit of my story. I see a little bit of my testimony in this as well. And I think most of you can as well. And I know that most of us haven't in this room been in prison. Some have. But we've been in prisons of our own making. And sometimes we've been in prisons of the sins that we've kept secret. And sometimes we're prisoners of the sins that we do out in the open. And we know it's hurting those around us. We know it's destroying our life. But we can't escape. And they chain us. And they start to destroy us. And aren't you so thankful that Jesus came to set the prisoners free? We can be freed from our own way of life. We can be free to have peace and forgiveness. We can be free to have joy even when life is hard and challenging and imperfect. Because Jesus has come to set the prisoners free. Praise God. But we also need to know that in God's kingdom, healing and miracles happen. This is where Jesus says in recovery of sight uh, for the blind, as he's declaring the good news about the kingdom. And do you know that in Jesus' three years of ministry, he did over 40 miracles. And actually one of the first things that he did when he sent out his disciples to do ministry on their own was he commanded them. He says in Luke 9, 6, uh, that they would to, to go out from village, and village, uh, from village to village to proclaim the good news and heal people everywhere. And then look again, what, what does Jesus say right before he, he returns to the Father in heaven after he had already been crucified, died, and rose again? He's, he's visiting them again to show them that it's, it's real. But he, before he returns, he says, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do good works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. 
And what's alluded there is that eventually he's going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to empower us to do great things that we can never do on our own. God living through us just as, as he worked through Jesus. And, you know, I personally believe that some of these great works include miracles. I really do. I used to be what was called a theological cessationist. I thought that when Jesus returned to the Father, there was a, a certain time frame that ended, and there was no more miracles, but... but I've lived too long now and have heard way too many stories of miracles happening. God is a God of miracles and healing nowadays. You know, I, I have a friend, believe this or don't believe it, he was responding to a situation, law, law enforcement. He has a shirt that has a hole in the front, in the back. He doesn't have a hole in him anywhere. Entrance wound, exit wound, he should be dead. Why is that? No one can explain to them. It doesn't make sense. There's no weird trajectory on his bulletproof vest he knows why it's because god was protecting him that day and he lets everyone know he proclaims that jesus is lord look what he can do and so i don't know i don't know why god doesn't give us all miracles i know some of you have lost loved ones i know that some of you are going through some mental struggles that we can't even imagine you face situations in your past that aren't right and aren't fair and you're not being released from that right now Some of you are facing sicknesses that are beyond your control. You've gotten bad news from a doctor. I don't know why God doesn't give us all miracles now. But I do know that as we look at this this idea of miracles and healing happening, first of all, God does sometimes do that to proclaim very boldly and bluntly, hey, I'm still here, and I'm active and alive, and I can do whatever I want, no matter what the laws of physics say. But I also think that as we're thinking about miracles and healing, we have to remember this whole now but not yet paradigm of the kingdom, right? He was establishing the kingdom when Jesus came, but it's not come to full fruition. And I think one of the greatest miracles that he's alluding to here is the final and greatest miracle of all, and that's that just like Jesus, we're going to be raised from the dead. I mean, is that not amazing? We get to live for eternity, And that's one of the greatest pieces of news that we can give for someone. Someone, whether or not they're facing something bad, whether or not, you know, if you've lost your sight or you've, you've lost some other ability, you're facing some kind of ailment, God promises that in his kingdom you will be healed. We can make that promise. We don't know when. We don't know if it's during this lifetime or if it's in the life to come, but God will heal. And we need to let people know that. Another amazing truth that we can declare about God's kingdom that is in in God's kingdom there is justice, right? Jesus said that he came to set the oppressed free. And the most basic definition of oppression is the unjust use of power at other people's expense. And Jesus just says, bottom line, this is not okay in my kingdom. It may be something that's happening in this world now, but I'm going to correct this. And, of course, we see, we can think of a million examples. We see it in politics. We see it when entire people groups are oppressed. We see this on individual, you know, levels. Maybe in the workplace, some, uh, a boss that doesn't treat you right. Or or maybe it's in your your, uh, marriage or some other relationship, this dynamic there where you're being taken advantage of because someone else has some kind of power over you, whether that's money or whatever it might be. But God says, Bottom line, I'm not going to tolerate this in my kingdom. And I think too often we as Christians think that God just overlooks oppressed people. But, you know, I think right now we can think of examples of, of God's kingdom shining through. And I love, I love the picture uh, that, um, that was once shared to me as we're reviewing the kingdom of God. It's kind of like someone sitting in this old, dark, dingy room and, and, and the glass is is smeared over with a tarry, sooty substance. And, and they're sitting there just kind of in doom and gloom. They don't, they don't really know what's outside, but we know it's bright and sunny and beautiful and the birds are out and it's green and flowers and it's just this wonderful thing. And then as we declare to people what, it's, what the kingdom is like, it's basically like just wiping off a little bit of that suit, right? Wiping off a little bit of that tar and just a little bit of that that light comes in and people look out and they get to see what the kingdom is like. And I feel like that it should be our approach as we're revealing 
the kingdom of God. We can see glimpses of God's kingdom shining through when, you know, organizations like Thirst No More, an organization that we partner with, goes into countries that are facing some level of oppression, and as a result, they don't have clean water. But Thirst No More is going in, and they're, they're reconciling that situation, digging wells. We see that even now, you know, uh, I think it was um, Keith, uh, uh, Derek, that was talking about the, the Sound of Freedom movie, Right? Like, to me, that's God's kingdom bursting through saying, hey, there's injustice, but I'm not going to tolerate that. And we see glimpses of that, and we know that not every problem is going to be fixed right here and now, but God is going to correct all that stuff that weighs on our hearts, where we turn on the news and we just can't believe it. We feel sick to our stomachs, and we can be consumed by it, right? But God says, no, I'm not going to allow that stuff to happen. In God's kingdom, there's justice. But a final truth that God talks about here, that Jesus talks about here, as he's talking about the good news of the kingdom, is that in God's kingdom, there's relief from the burdens of this world. And that's at the very tail end of verse 19, where he says that he's come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, the idea of this being the year of the Lord's favor as he's talking about, it's harkening back all the way back to this Old Testament concept of the year of the Jubilee, Maybe you've heard about this, where every 50 years, it was basically people would be released from their debts. They would be released if they were in any kind of slavery, whether indentured or or otherwise. And property would be returned to the people who owned it. And, you know, one of the most exciting things to me about this year of Jubilee, or this, uh, this year of the Lord's favor, is actually that that... This was a time for people to have rest, okay? It was a time for them to go home and to be reunified with their family, to be reunified with the ones that they loved. I once listened to a, a podcast by, uh, and, and Warren Buffett was, was on it, and he was just talking about this idea of happiness. And he said, I, I won't lie to you, wealth does bring some happiness. But you may not believe this, but some of the most miserable people in the world that I've ever met are the richest, some of the richest people in the world who have wealth beyond their imagination. He says, and they're miserable because they've driven everyone who ever loved them away from them. They have no loving relationships. And I think what he's hitting, you know, he's making a major point here, he's hitting the nail on the head, is that the deepest satisfaction from life comes from relationships it's not the things that we have we if you've ever you know gotten that nice new brand new phone it's exciting for a while but it does doesn't fill the hole in your heart right or whatever other thing that you think you need that position that that certain level of income we know that there's a happiness that comes from that but there's always a deep longing that i think can only be filled by god and through the relationships that he's he's provided for us And I think that the kingdom of God is about releasing us from the burdens of this world, in part from this idea that I have to perform more, I have to get more, I have to consume more, and it releases us to the things that are more important, to the people of this world, to the relationships. The kingdom of God is all about restoring relationships with God, even with ourselves and with other people and the rest of creation. That is what the kingdom of God is like, that we get to eternally enjoy a relationship with those we love and with the Father. And I love that this is a, a promise for us both now and in the future. That yes, we, we may experience this, this uh, sense of sorrow now as we lose the people we love But someday we're going to be reunited with them. And someday we're going to be reunited with God the Father. And so at the end of of each sermon uh, in this series, we've been giving you a call to action. And my call to action to you today is speak the truth of the kingdom into the life of one of the people on your sent list. And I love how uh, Jeff... um, Vanderstelt talks about this. I may have said his name wrong. But he says, he, he, he calls this gospel fluency. It's like sometimes we, we're talking to people 
And we're speaking a different language when we're giving the gospel presentation. And so we talk louder, right? And, and we talk slower and we think that somehow they're just going to get it. But the truth is we need to be speaking the same language, right? We need to become fluent in their language if we're ever going to communicate with them. And so we need to learn how to speak the truth of the kingdom into the lives of the people in our sent list. And my question to you is what do they need to hear? What component of that good news that we talked about do they need to hear? Maybe they do need to, to have a conversation about sin, that they can be forgiven, that they can be set free. Maybe they do need to know that God cares for the poor. Maybe they are poor, and you need to, to do what Keith said last week and, and demonstrate that, demonstrate the gospel to them. Maybe they need to know that, yeah, this world is horrible, but God hasn't forgotten about the world. There will be justice. Maybe they need to know that God can heal, that they can call on a good father, and that God promises to heal them either now in this life or in the future if they call upon his name. Maybe they need to know that they can be relieved from the burdens that are chaining them down. They may be the wealthiest person you know. They may be successful on the outside, but they're dying on the inside, and they just need to know I can be released from these chains and released to the things that are most important to God. And so prayerfully consider how can you speak the truth of the kingdom into the lives of the people on your sent list.